momentum moving into the fall. Let's begin. Think you know the news of the day? Think again with Boyd Matheson on KSL News Radio. Of course, a lot of the chatter and clamor has uh, been about who is not going to be in Milwaukee tonight, and we're going to just let that slide on past uh, because there's nothing to see there. Uh, so we want to get to the real issues today and give you a little bit of a scorecard to play with tonight as you watch and listen uh, to this debate. Eight candidates on the stage, uh, all vying for the Republican nomination for president. And some of these candidates you may not know at all. Some you may know a little bit about. But we want to dig into what do you what should you be watching for? What does winning look like for each of these candidates? We're actually going to do this throughout the program. We're going to do four of the candidates here right off the top of the show. And then we're going to come back at 2.05 and do the remaining four candidates. So you'll have a good little thumbnail sketch of each of the candidates, a little bit of sound of what they're focused on and what their agenda might be tonight uh, to help you make some informed decisions and some informed listening uh, so that you're not just getting caught with whatever the drama might be tonight or whatever the theatrics might be, but actually get to the principles and policy around the things that we should be looking for in a presidential nominee. So let's start with one of the lesser known candidates uh, who I happen happen to really like. Uh, He is a policy guy. Uh, Last week at the Iowa State Fair, Asa Hutchinson, of course, former uh, governor of Arkansas, outlined what he would tackle as it relates to the border. I was head of the charge of border security uh, during the Bush administration. We didn't get it perfect, but it looks perfect compared to what we see today. And so I know what needs to be done. You put the resources there, you reform our asylum laws, and you designate the cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. So, very interesting. Those were very specific things coming from Asa Hutchinson, which I think is his strong suit. I also think that's important in a debate. When you are looking at a lot of sweeping generalities, and you will hear a lot of sweeping generalities tonight, when you hear specifics, your ears should perk up. You should lean in because that's someone who's serious. They've really thought about it beyond just the talking points and bullets. Uh, They're looking at uh, real details. Details matter when you're governing. And so I think that's going to be where Ace uh, Hutchinson is going to try to play tonight is he's going to get to the specifics. Sometimes that's not super exciting. Sometimes that's not a big wow moment. So you actually have to listen. You have to lean in, kind of listen, and say, okay, what is this person really going after? Uh, And this was just one example as relating to border security. He painted the picture. I've been there. I was there uh, over in charge of border security in the Bush administration. And then he got to very specific things. Reform on asylum laws, designating cartels as foreign terrorist organizations, and he started to lay it out. So you could actually see it and say, okay, whether you agree with that or not, that's not the issue. But he's laying out specifics. That's important. That's going to be his strength. Uh, He's not going to be the one that's going to have uh, the memorable line of the night. I don't think that's going to be uh, what happens with Asa Hutchinson tonight. But he can get to some specifics that might get people to say he's very thoughtful, he's very knowledgeable, And then you can envision it. Is that someone I can see sitting behind the Resolute desk in the Oval Office? Senator Tim Scott has been on the rise of late, has some energy and momentum around his campaign as one of the alternatives uh, to the former president. Uh, Senator Scott recently explained what his strategy would be for tonight's debate. I'm going to tell my story about why I believe that America can do for anyone what she's done for me. We're going to focus on restoring hope creating opportunities, and protecting the America that we all love. What about landing punches on DeSantis? We'll focus on our (laughs) message and worry about the other candidates another time. All right, so very clear. Tim Scott is not worried about who else is on the stage tonight. He has a message he wants to deliver, and this will be the challenge. He sort of has the reverse challenge of Asa Hutchinson. Tim Scott is very dynamic, very charismatic, can string sentences together, and you will find yourself nodding along. Uh, often saying, I'd go to that guy's church any Sunday uh, and listen to that. But he does have a very hopeful message, and he does have a very compelling story. I think the challenge for Tim Scott tonight is going to be lacing in some of those specifics, some of the details in terms of policy. He has a great vision for the country, who we are, and who we are not. He has a, a great way to describe uh, what should be the norm in this country, not the exception. And I do believe he's going to stay away from battling it out with uh, Ron DeSantis or anybody else on the stage or anybody not on the stage. 
he's going to stick to a very tight script tonight. But he has to be careful that he doesn't become too rote. He has some great lines, but it does. it's sort of the Marco Rubio factor. If you say him one too many times in one debate, uh, you come off as a little over-scripted uh, or a little too stuck on, on your own uh, style talking point, uh, and that can be a challenge. So he's got to lace it in, have that hope, have that energy. People can say, oh, yeah, I'd follow that guy into battle. Uh, then he's got to put some specifics underneath it to help bolster the credibility that he can actually do the job. That's the real test for Senator Tim Scott tonight. All right, now we're going to move on uh, to North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, uh, who, if he is on the debate stage tonight, will be playing hurt. Uh, So if you have not followed the news today, Doug Burgum, in his preparations for the debate, uh, was doing the good thing. He was getting a little exercise in. He was playing some pickup basketball with his staffers and uh, has has a leg injury. He was taken to the emergency room. We just saw an image just about five minutes ago uh, of him doing the, quote, walkthrough of the debate stage. He was doing it on crutches, so he was not walking through the walkthrough. He was hobbling through. We couldn't actually see if he was in a boot or a cast, uh, so we don't know the full ex- extent of his injuries or how that might impact whether or not he ends up on the stage tonight. Uh, But he is someone who has uh, an opportunity tonight. Uh, He has uh, a great record in terms of North Dakota. He has some interesting policy positions that I think differentiate him. Uh, He's put a lot of his own money in. He's obviously very successful as an entrepreneur as well as as a governor. So he has an interesting uh, two-step there in terms of both the entrepreneurial business side as well as governing a state side. And his job is to really introduce himself to everyone, and we expect that's probably where he's going to head tonight. A kid from a small town that understands, you know, gratitude, humility, uh, hard work, uh, has the courage to stand up and do stuff, who knows how to create jobs, has, I've I've been making payroll every two weeks since I was in my mid-twenties. I understand what it's like as a small business owner. I understand what working people are going through. And we've got the proven, proven track record in North Dakota. We're on track to have the highest GDP in the nation in North Dakota. We've cut taxes. We've reduced red tape. We know how to get government out of people's lives so people People can uh, live their lives to their fullest. We know we can improve every American life under a Bergam administration. So I think the big challenge for the governor is to not over North dakota it. <laughs> He's got to make it national. So he can talk about what he did in North Carolina but or North Dakota, but he has to do it quickly, and then he has to pivot to the national stage. So he can talk about the fact that in North Carolina, we cut taxes so that our citizens can do this. We reduce red tape so our entrepreneurs and businesses were able to expand. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do in the White House. And so he has to make that pivot very swiftly. Uh, it's the same thing with uh, Ron DeSantis. They have to make the pivot. It can't just be about where you've been or where you are. It has to be about applying it to what's next which is the presidency. Uh, Finally, in this segment, and again, we're going to come back to this at 2.05 to round out the rest of the field, but let's uh, round out this segment with Chris Christie. Chris Christie, of course, will not have his primary target of his campaign, and that is the former president. So will he pivot or will he keep pounding on the former president? Uh, As he talked about some of the things that matter to him beyond defeating the former president, here's where he went. First is education. And I'm going to give a speech on this after Labor Day, but we're going to go for educational freedom in the extreme. I want every family in this country to have an educational freedom account. We spend $800 billion a year in this country on K-12 education, and we're getting mediocre results as a, as a, as a, despite that money. I want every parent in this country to decide where their kids go to school. I think this is a unique opportunity for Chris Christie to show that he's not just a one-punch kind of politician going after the former president. I think going into things like education, he gave a brilliant speech, I think one of the best of his career, on character without going after anyone, just the principle of it. I think he has a very unique space to show he's not just an anti-candidate, but that he's for a host of things and has a strategy to actually get there. We're going to stay with this conversation. Stick with us at 2.05. We'll come back and round out the rest of the players in tonight's first Republican debate for uh, the potential presidency of the United States. So stay with us here on KSL News Radio.
Think again on Inside Sources with Boyd Matheson. When the day's almost done. Another day, another dollar. There's the drive home. <sighs> Put Jeff Kaplan in the passenger seat. Hey, how's it going? Um, good, thanks. You're in my car. Yep, let me catch you up. Jeff has traffic and weather together every 10 minutes on the nines, breaking stories, and his signature minute of news. It's like Jeff's there just for you. This is a little awkward. Isn't it great? Jeff Kaplan's Afternoon News, 3 to 7 on KSL News Radio. When I first started my soda weight loss journey, I have to tell you, I was a little stressed. Making that kind of commitment and doing it publicly uh, is, a, is a big risk. I was a little bit worried, Uh, but I'm telling you, from the moment I started with SOTA Weight Loss, S-O-T-A stands for state-of-the-art weight loss, I knew I wasn't alone. I had a coach. I had weekly connection. I could call or text anytime to make sure I was staying on path. The 37 pounds just dropped in the first 90 days, and here I am almost two years down the road, and I'm still 37 pounds down. I feel great. I have more energy, and there's nothing to be afraid of because you don't do it alone when it comes to soda. You have that coach and nutritionist. You really attack everything, all points of the compass, emotional eating, your habits, your behaviors. How do you get food as fuel to really change the game in your life? So check it out at Soda Weight Loss. As I always say, when it comes to your Soda Weight Loss journey, there's no time to lose, only time to win. So check it out at SodaWeightLoss.com, S-O-T-A WeightLoss.com. At Intermountain Primary Children's Hospital, we made a bold promise to build the nation's model health system for children. Join us in realizing our vision for the future of pediatric care. So together, we can expand primary children's impact and ensure every child has access to the right care at the right place at the right time. For a century, Primary Children's has kept the child first and always. Help us continue to do so for the next 100 years. To get involved, visit primarypromise.org. Join Mike Stevens of Capital Wealth Advisors for Retire Right Radio, Saturdays at 5 a.m. and 9 p.m. That's Retire Right Radio with Mike Stevens, Saturdays at 5 a.m. and 9 p.m. We have more breaking news and update on that plane crash. Kara Hoffelmeyer joins joins us in studio. Yeah, Boyd, so we're learning that plane crash in West Jordan at the South Valley Regional Hospital. We told you that one person was dead, and it will probably just stay that number. What we're learning from the FAA right now is that there was only a pilot on board that plane. That pilot is the only person since they're on that plane who has died. So one fatality in that plane crash in West Jordan this afternoon. Boy. All right, Kara Hoffelmeyer, thanks for that update. Continue to follow it on KSL News Radio. We'll be back with more inside sources in just a minute. Hi, I'm Heather Kelly with KSL News Radio. I have a podcast, Money Making Sense. My passion is to help people keep more money in their pockets by learning how to cut costs. Unplugging unused gadgets can cut your bill by 10%. This includes anything from understanding your health insurance options. How do those co-payments or deductibles or out-of-pockets play in? And what is it going to cost me? To smart strategies for buying a home on your budget. But it isn't all about the cash. Not getting scammed and preventing financial abuse is a big part of Money Making Sense. The biggest piece that's holding women back on being able to leave is feeling financially trapped. Basically, if money affects your life in any way, I'll talk about it. That includes speaking with ambassadors, state governors, and even the U.S. Secretary of Transportation about where your tax dollars are going. Follow Money Making Sense for free wherever you get your favorite podcasts on kslpodcast.com or the KSL News Radio app. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bomas. First, one person has died in a plane crash near the West Jordan Airport. Second, police looking for human remains in an area near Causey Reservoir, hoping they might be able to find the uh, remains of a woman who's been missing for almost 40 years. And third, the leader of the Wagner Mercenary Group in Russia was on the passenger list of a plane that crashed north of Moscow. Evgeny Prigozhin led a short-lived rebellion against Russia's military leadership in Ukraine. Right now, 82 degrees, partly cloudy in Salt Lake City. And back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Boyd Matheson divides rage from reason on Inside Sources. Really thrilled to have back on the program with us today, Representative John Curtis. And uh, Representative Curtis, we know uh, August is a, is a crazy time as you're trying to balance all the things that have to be done in the district, sneak in a little family time, and uh, do all the other things that need to be done before you get back to what will be a uh, brutal slate uh, and some pretty big decisions to be made uh, rolling in after Labor Day. 
you were part of a, an event yesterday down at Utah Valley University that, for the, the Center for Constitutional Studies, the Gary R. Herbert Institute, and, of course, the Sutherland Institute, uh, and really laid out some things that I think are important for all of us to think about, especially going into a, a debate night on the national stage uh, in the Republican presidential primary, uh, but also some important things for us to be thinking about uh, not just in our own state or communities, but actually when we when we look in the mirror. Uh, and you talked about uh, some of the dysfunction going on and, and what can be done about it. So lay the groundwork and then let's dive into some of the possibilities. Well, thanks, Boyd. It's, it's great to talk to you. I, in the speech, I explored things that I had seen from my perspective. And I think a lot of times, you know, I see a different perspective uh, than other people and I'm kind of in the middle of it. So I, I wanted to share what I was seeing and Really, um, there were not um, really um, unusual things, uh, but things that are kind of commonplace that are happening. And a lot of it deals with rewarding the wrong behavior and not paying enough attention uh, to who we're electing. And uh, uh, there were about 10 different things like that that I mentioned that I thought were important. Yeah, and so let's dig into a few of those. And let's start with uh, when we always called it uh, the uh, let's not reward bad behavior policy. That's a parenting <laughs> strategy to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's been my observation that um, the, the, the bad behavior is rewarded and good behavior is ignored back there. And that's by... Uh, by the media, it's by donors, it's by constituents, and so it, it tends to attract those who who will do and say things that get a lot of attention, but don't really get anything done, and often actually are are, are very detrimental to the process. Yeah, I think that's a, a crucial part of that. And one of the other things that you you pointed out that I want to make sure we get to, because I think this is so important for voters to think through. And that is to really look at someone's whole body of work. So often all the campaign ads are focused on some obscure vote and maybe it was a procedural vote rather than looking at a whole body of work. How do you see that uh, from your unique perch there? Well, I don't mind telling you I get frustrated sometimes because somebody will come and say, you know, well, why didn't you respond to this tweet or, or why did you vote this way? And those are all good, legitimate questions. I'm not saying they shouldn't ask those questions, but they don't look at everything I'm doing. So, for instance, there was a time when I was down in southern Utah. We were working on some really important things for the Navajo tribe with all of my staff and people back in the district were mad that I hadn't responded to, to a tweet of President Trump that morning. And that's where I felt like, gosh, I wish you could see what I was doing that you would have pulled me off of to respond to that t tweet. And that's why I say, if you look at the whole body of work, like what, what overall are you doing? What things are you accomplishing? Not what did you do in that one moment or what did you do with that tweet? Yeah, so important. Uh, you also talked about this idea that we, we need to really call balls and strikes, that we kind of need to be blind to party when we actually evaluate someone's performance in office. Yeah, I don't mind telling you, I felt a little uh, a hypocrisy myself uh, with this one. I think we all do this. I think of you know, some votes I have taken that either protect the Republican or, or, or hurt on the Democrat. But I think this is one of the things we all need to work on better, and that's calling out when people with our political philosophy do things that are not, that are not acceptable. And not over, you know, and, 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 and use that exact same standard on the other political side. And I, I don't mind telling you, I think we all struggle with this one. Yeah, I think that's a, a difficult one, and especially it goes to that vicious cycle of what gets rewarded, what gets acknowledged, what exactly. uh, funds campaigns for reelection. And uh, that, that becomes a very, not only a vicious cycle, but a self fulfilling prophecy in terms of the division in the country. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you're right. So as, as you look at the path forward, uh, I, I love that you say, okay, look, elected officials have this responsibility. We need to do that. And then there's also this responsibility that goes to, to we the people, that goes on to the voter uh, in terms of what they're doing uh, when they look in the mirror or when, when they get online. You know, I, I know that this is not good for me to say because this will make your listeners mad. But sometimes, you know, I would frequently get uh, criticized that I was not controlling President Trump. And I often felt like saying, you know, Congress doesn't elect the president. You do. Mm. <laughs> it's, like, it's like I didn't elect. You know, it's like it's no that you, you the people elected them. You can't you can't all of a sudden expect me to fix what you have done. Yeah, I think that's I think that's so vital that we look at that. And, and that is why every vote matters. Every voice does make a difference. 
uh, but you have to show up and do it. And then, and then we have to be accountable. Uh, I would say it's it's not uh, voting is not just one of those uh, you get what you pay for. Uh, you pay for what you get, and you get what you choose. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, and that becomes a, a pretty vicious cycle as well. Exactly, and I, I really do think. Uh, most of us don't take enough time evaluating candidates, and part of the speech was that we too often are fooled by a good speech, and we don't really look into the character of a person. We don't look into their life experiences. You know, it's interesting. When I was elected, uh, nobody knew that I'd be voting on impeachment. Nobody knew I'd be dealing with January 6th. Nobody knew I'd be dealing with COVID. So you have to elect people who are going to face problems that you can't see. Mm. And so what is their character? What is their life experience? What what do they have in their background that will tell you they'll be prepared for January 6th or for COVID or for Ukraine or for, you know, financial crisis or, or the many, many things that come up with that you, you never know during a campaign? Yeah. And that, uh, I'm so glad you raised that because it, it is it's you, you want to know, do they have the character? Uh, to do the hard thing uh, when it's really, really hard, uh, not when it's easy. We, we always say when the uh, you know when the sea is calm and the breeze light and the sun's out, everybody's everybody's a good captain. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but when yep. when the storm comes and the wind's blowing and the waves are crashing, uh, you'll find out if you have a, a real captain on your on your ship. Yeah, it's it's easy in a debate or in a speech to say, look, this is what I would do, or this is you know, this is uh, you know. This is me. And I, I look and think, well, what have you done in your life that would show us that, that, that you know, that you, you can do that? Yeah. Uh, we send people to office that can't get jobs in the private sector. Mm. I had an employee once that I had to let go, and he said, you can't let me go. No one will hire me. I said, oh, perfect. <laughs> You'd make a great elected official. <laughs> <laughs> but can you give a speech, right? Yeah, exactly. How's your how's your uh, social media skills? <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you. <laughs> You're in. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that you pointed out that was a nuanced component that I, I want to make sure we hit, and that is this idea of we really do need leaders that lead. Uh, we've kind of gone to this emotive elected official where it's you know it's telling people what they want to hear as opposed to actually leading. It's uh, the old saying of, you know, you got to be close enough to the people so that you're connected and they feel connected, but you're far enough ahead that you're actually worth following. But it seems like we've gotten to this, it's almost a validation role of, I'm here to validate your grievances. How do we how do we change that dynamic? You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. So I, I went through an election uh, last year and, and uh, I was, you know, met with a lot of people, talked with a lot of people, I didn't hear once the term statesman, mm. not not once, and that used to be a qualification uh, that was envied and that was that you know that we looked for and sought out, and I, not once did I hear uh, the, the term statesman or anybody asking questions that got to the nut, you know the, the core of of are you a statesman? And I think too often politicians tell people what they want to hear, which of course is one of the reasons I think people are so mad at elected officials. And uh, they do what's easy instead of what's hard. That's, a, that's exactly where we got to get and exactly the game that's got to be changed. This was a, a real crucial conversation. Again, took place at uh, Utah Valley University Center for Constitutional Studies yesterday. And uh, Representative Curtis, we appreciate you bringing this to light, bringing some real sharp focus in terms of what this looks like, what this sounds like, because I think for voters, that's the key to recognize it and then to validate it and reward it, vote for it. Uh, and that's actually how we change things. And things won't change overnight, but they can start changing today if we'll just look at some of these principles that you laid out uh, yesterday uh, in terms of how we're looking at elected officials, holding them accountable, and then, of course, getting to that uh, voting for people of character. Uh, Congressman Curtis, we know it's a very busy day for you, and uh, we really appreciate you carving out time for us, as always, and elevating the conversation for us here on Inside Sources. Thanks, Boyd. Uh, always a pleasure. We'll step aside for some bottom of the hour news. More inside sources coming up next. We're going to talk about trusting the process and the sweet sequence, why it matters to success. Stick around. We'll be right back. It's 1 30 at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bonas. KSL's top local story this hour. One person has died in a plane crash in West Jordan this afternoon. The FAA says the pilot was the only person aboard the single-engine plane that went down near the South Valley Regional Airport. Police are asking the public to steer clear of the area at New Bingham Road by Airport Road in 7800 South. Senator Mike Lee says he wishes former President Trump were still president, but 
stopped short of endorsing him again. KSL News Radio's Lindsay Ertz has more. At a town hall Q&A in Lehigh, Senator Lee pressed on his support of the four-time indicted former president. Lee tried to make the case that a Biden-led America has left people dealing with inflation when audience members shouted at him to answer the question. Month after month. Yeah, I'm getting there, ma'am. Month after month they've been incurring that. So yes, do I wish Donald Trump were still president of the United States? Absolutely, without yeah. question. Lee specifically said he's not endorsing anyone yet. But I, I wish he were still president, and if he gets elected president again, that'd be good for America. America has suffered enough under Joe Biden. Late last month, he went to a fundraiser in Pleasant Grove for Governor Ron DeSantis. Lindsay Ertz, KSL News Radio. Our top national story this hour from ABC News. Russian media reports say Evgeny Prigozhin was aboard a private jet that crashed north of Moscow. He's the leader of the Wagner mercenary group who led an armed rebellion against Russia's military leadership in Ukraine. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge in Kiev explains this could be huge for the Ukraine war. What we have to bear in mind right now is that Yevgeny Prigozhin was listed as being on board that plane. We can't confirm at this point in time whether he was definitely on board and whether he is definitely dead. But if he is and if he was on board that plane, it is hugely significant. And your money at this moment, the uh, Dow Jones average up 169 points on the day right now. The Nasdaq having an even stronger update, up 235 points right now. And our KSL weather, yeah, we'll see some more thunderstorms before we're done. That's next, KSL News Time 132. Start your days with knowledgeable, friendly voices telling you about the latest news and weather out there. Hi, this is Tim Hughes and Amanda Dixon. In the business of waking you up each morning from 5 to 9 on KSL News Radio. Needing a mortgage? Press 1 if you're purchasing a home. Press 2 if this home is a refinance. Press 3 if you need cash back. Your wait time is 20. Need a great way to begin a home mortgage loan? Pressing buttons hoping that you'll end up with an actual experienced loan officer is not a smart way to start. Often it brings higher rates, higher costs, and long closing times. On the other hand, you can call Loans by Rick and speak directly to Rick, a mortgage lender that has closed thousands of loans since 2002. Rick will pick up your call every time. You only talk to Rick, not option one, two, or three. Closing is fast in 12 to 22 days from submission to clear to close with low rates and low closing costs. Call Loans by Rick at 801-809-SAVE. That's 801-809-SAVE or click loansbyrick.com. Rick Kirschenbaum, NMLS 241179 and Vintage Lending, NMLS 287106 are equal housing lenders. I can't wait for what's next. Even with higher stroke risk due to atrial fibrillation and a regular heartbeat not caused by a heart valve problem. Eliquis, the Pixaban tablets, reduces stroke risk. It's the number one cardiologist prescribed blood thinner. Don't stop taking prescription Eliquis without talking to your doctor, as this may increase your risk of stroke. Eliquis can cause serious and in rare cases fatal bleeding. Don't take Eliquis if you have an artificial heart valve, abnormal bleeding, or have antiphospholipid syndrome. While taking, you may bruise more easily or take longer for bleeding to stop. A spinal injection while on Eliquis increases risk of blood clots, which may cause paralysis, the inability to move. Get medical help right away for unexpected bleeding or unusual bruising, or if you have tingling, numbness, or muscle weakness. It may increase your bleeding risk if you take medicines such as aspirin products, NSAIDs, SSRIs, SNRIs, and blood thinners. Tell your doctor about all planned medical or dental procedures. Learn more at Eliquis.com or call 1-855-ELIQUIS. Traffic and weather together brought to you by Granite Credit Union's High Yield Savings Certificates. Here's Ricky Meeks. Still a good looking drive on all the Valley freeways, but again, heads up West Jordan drivers. We will have the road closed for quite some time and West Jordan City is asking you avoid the area at Copper Hills Parkway and 7800 South. The road 7800 South and Airport Road on Copper Hills Parkway is going to be closed for some time to investigate the plane crash. New Bingham is also seeing some heavy delays. If you need to travel that area, consider an alternate route. This weekend, Crossroads of the West Gun Show comes to the Davis Conference Center in Layton. Get great deals on guns, plus you can buy, sell, or trade at the show. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. KSL weather, the chance of isolated thunderstorms will stay in the forecast through Friday. With highs in the upper 80s, we'll dry out and warm up into the 90s this weekend. 
And right now, we're at 82 degrees, partly cloudy skies at KSL News Radio 102.7 FM, 1160 AM, and KSLNewsRadio.com. Your all day companion for news. Inside Sources. Inside, Inside Sources. America's Voice of Reason, Boyd Matheson, on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Well, we often talk about succeed, how you succeed in America, what that path actually looks like. We quote a lot of uh, coaches of sporting uh, athletes who say, trust the process and follow the sequence. Uh, and athletes that do that usually end up being quite successful. You got to trust the process and follow the sequence. We want to look at that in a little different way today. And uh, we're really thrilled to have back on the program with us. Brad Wilcox is the director of the National Marriage Project and is the Future of Freedom Fellow at the Institute for Family Studies. He's also the author of a new book that launches uh, next year uh, called Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization. And uh, Brad, welcome back to the show. Yeah, great to be here, boy. Thanks for having me on. Uh, and so let's start just with the with the sequence, the success sequence. There's a lot of them out there in uh, sports and other places in business. Uh, you're talking about it in terms of just being successful in life, what is the right success sequence? So what we see in the research is that there are three steps that are linked to much better outcomes for young adults, and that's getting at least a high school degree, or I would say, you know, getting a technical degree of some sort, like a trade or getting a college degree, um, working full-time in your early 20s, and then getting married before having kids. So basically the story is that education, work, and marriage are the three foundations for getting off to a strong start as a young adult in America today. Uh, and as you look at that, that data and the research, what is, so what does it show in terms of the, the outcome, the ultimate results in terms of what happens when you follow that sequence? So young adults who follow that sequence, um, you know, by and large, avoid poverty. We see that, you know, in their late 20s and 30s, 97 percent of them are not poor and 86 percent of them have reached the middle class or higher. So the point here some ways is to kind of basically give people some confidence that if they get that um, that basic education, if they are working full time and uh, or if they're married before having kids, you know, their odds of of succeeding or prospering or being financially secure are just much higher here in America um, than if they don't kind of take care of those three basic steps. And that's always such an interesting debate. I'm sure if you walked into a high school or a college classroom and said, look, I, I can give you a simple sequence, 97% chance you're going to stay out of poverty and actually a really high percent that you're going to make it into the middle class or better, I think everybody would want to know the secret sauce. Uh, but then when it has to do with, with education, work, and marriage, uh, people are, are less interested. But the numbers, and which is what we love about the way you go about this, Brad, uh, the numbers don't lie on this. Yeah, and I think, you know, we have to recognize, too, that there are, I mean, and, and we can all take situations where kids have been poorly served by a school or, um, you know, there's there's some reason why work is extremely difficult in terms of disability, you know. There obviously there are exceptions here, and we sure. can't minimize those. But I think the point is that for ordinary kind of, you know, runs of mill young adults, just have to realize that if you do these basic things in terms of, you know, uh, making the effort to get that education, and then um, are working full time, or a married son is working full time, um, and you put the, you know, marriage before the baby carriage, you know, your odds of, of doing well are, 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 are super high. And unfortunately, we're seeing, even in Utah, um, a growing number of young adult men not working full time. And we're also seeing, you know, uh, people postponing or foregoing marriage, um, even when they're having kids, too. So, um, you know, these are the things that we want to kind of try to um, sort of minimize uh, across the country, but also in Utah. And that is just to basically encourage young adults, particularly young men, to be more intentional about working full-time and also encourage couples um, who are thinking about having kids to um, to get married before they, you know, they have those children. Yeah, and let's, let's unpack that a little bit uh, because, as always, I love the way you take the numbers and the data and then you actually get into some real practical principles and then even some good public policy in terms of how do you strengthen that. 
Uh, you had a great piece at Deseret.com uh, with uh, Derek Monson and David Bass. I think we're your tag team partners on that. Uh, and let's start with this this component of work. Uh, dig into that a little bit in terms of that disconnect, particularly with young men, uh, both across the country and, as you mentioned, here in the state of Utah. Yeah, so what we've been seeing is there's been a pretty marked decline in uh, men working full-time in the United States in, the, in sort of the prime years, you know, roughly in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, and this is particularly true for men who don't have a college degree. We're seeing about one in five of those guys in their prime um, not working full-time. And this is just, it's a lot of guys who are, who are not connected to a, you know, to a full-time job. And that's important because, um, you know, it has financial implications for them, any, any, you know, any family that they might have. But also, um, we know, too, that men who are not working full-time are often more likely to be struggling with, you know, depression, uh, dissatisfaction, et cetera. So, you know, work matters for men's sense of self-worth, not just their financial uh, well-being. And in Utah, in particular, what we've seen, basically, is that the share of men who are aged 20 to 40 working full-time has fallen by four percentage points um, over the last two decades. And again, it might not seem like a huge number, but it's just it's just worrisome that we are seeing even in Utah kind of the number, the share of, of young men who are connected to the labor force, you know, ticking downwards. And when I was out in Utah back in March, I talked to a number of, of mothers of um, young men who were kind of expressing, you know, their concern that this sort of male malaise has kind of reached Utah as well. Mm, fascinating. So now let's look at the uh, the vision forward. Uh, in terms of how do we actually take the success sequence and how do we actually turn that into some good policy or some good uh, scaffolding or support structure uh, to actually produce those results and and really reinforce that? So in terms of kind of how the success sequence could roll out in Utah, you know, one thing that could happen is school districts could kind of create curricula that introduces the sequence to middle schoolers and high schoolers kind of lets them know how much, you know, particularly work, I think, because I think education is obviously already pretty, pretty apparent, but sort of how much work, full-time work matter, um, or work matters, and how much marriage matters before having kids. Um, to have also the Utah State Board of Education incorporate a family life standard, maybe connecting it to the financial literacy requirement already kind of that's um, enforced in Utah, mm. but then also thinking too about ways to incorporate the sequence into premarital education that's offered uh, by entities like the Utah Marriage Commission. Um, and then the final thing that I would sort of mention here too is just thinking about the power of PSAs. I was in Utah recently for a conference, and as I was driving out to the airport in the morning, early morning, I saw a big billboard on the way to the airport kind of talking about the importance of parents um, kind of monitoring their kids' social media usage um, and heartened to see that, of course. But we could kind of do the same thing with the success sequence, have billboards kind of communicating its value um, on highways across, you know, the state of Utah. And then also doing PSAs on social media where obviously a lot of teenagers are, uh, are spending time to kind of communicate to them in sort of accessible and compelling ways how much working full-time matters um, and how much uh, putting marriage before the baby carriage matters in terms of getting off to the right start for, you know, when it comes to forming a family. Yeah, great insight, great perspective as always. Before I let you go, Brad, just uh, last minute, uh, what's something kind of underneath these numbers? Give us a, a nuanced piece that maybe nobody's talking about or things that you wish we would talk about more uh, as it relates to the sequence and really helping people not just survive but really thrive and succeed. You know, I think one thing that I you know, the critics of the success sequence, you know, and they're they're playing out there, you know, want to say, well, um, you know, it comes to this whole thing, it's really work that makes all the difference. It's not marriage. And what they fail, I think, to acknowledge is that for women, what often happens if people are not getting married is they end up as single moms. And there are real financial challenges there because they're not getting a hundred percent of the dad's income, you know, to help raise that kid. Um, or those children. And so that's, you know, that's a, that's a big financial deal that they're not acknowledging um, in kind of critiquing this sequence. Um, and then when it comes to men, they're not kind of acknowledging that, um, you know, when men are non residential dads, you know, they're, they're paying child support, they're not as motivated to sort of support their families when they're not married to the mother of their children. Um, and so the point I'm making here is that people need to understand that, you know, marriage 
um, has real financial implications for families in America. And, you know, getting married before you have kids and doing all that you can to try to stay married once you have children really puts your family and your kids off on a better financial footing. Um, and by contrast, when you don't do that, there are a lot of costs. So just to give one final example, I talked to a guy um, who had, had kids with three different women, and a substantial share of his, you know, his paycheck every, you know, every two weeks goes to, um, you know, basically those, those households. Um, and he's just gotten married uh, recently to someone else. And he can't bring that much money into that new marriage, um, and that's a source of frustration for him. So the point I'm getting at, uh, Boyd, is that family instability is more likely for folks having kids outside of marriage. Mm -hmm. And um, we just have to be, I think, honest about you know making that point to young adults today. Yeah, it always comes back to that absolute predictability of consequences and choices. And uh, I think that sequence just gives you a nice framing in terms of looking at what that really does and what that really means. And as you said, having an honest conversation uh, about the impact that has on everyone from children to mothers to fathers uh, to the community and society as a whole. Uh, Brad Wilcox, director of the National Marriage Project and is the Future of Freedom Fellow at the Institute for Family Studies. And uh, Brad, always appreciate your perspective. Thanks for joining us today. Boy, thanks for having me on today. Appreciate it. Uh, great perspective there. And that sequence matters. Education, work, marriage, family. Trust the process. Follow the sequence. We'll be right back. Back to school, back to back-to-back -back classes, and back to basics. When you're back to running errands and back in the car, depend on this station to keep you moving with traffic and weather together every 10 minutes on the nines. We've got your back. Mornings and afternoons on KSL News Radio. You're ready to really get your financial house in order. No better place to do that than with our friends at Hercules Credit Union. They've been about growing stronger together since 1946. they got a long track record of results. And right now is a great chance for you to go for the gold. All you have to do is opening a checking account at Hercules Credit Union, qualify for gold tier status in the first 90 days, and they'll deposit $200 into your account. Just mention you heard this on KSL. Again, follow the process. Trust the process today. Uh, get that gold tier status within 90 days, and uh, you'll get $200 deposited into your account. Plus, you get all the benefits of gold tier checking. You'll get travel benefits, cellular care coverage, health and wellness savings, family benefits, Ticket Express, uh, and the list goes on and on. It's all part of what Hercules Credit Union brings to you. Uh, you can find their locations in Taylorsville, Harriman, Riverton, or Salt Lake City. Or, as always, with our friends at Hercules Credit Union, you can find them online at HerculesCU.com. That's HerculesCU.com. Every business deserves a great deal. That's why, for a limited time, we're launching the Mobile Made Free event. With Comcast Business Internet, new and existing customers can get one year of unlimited mobile for free. Yep, you heard that right. An entire year free. It's our best internet, powered by the next generation 10G network and with 99.9% .9 reliability plus one line of free mobile for a year. The Mobile Made Free event is happening now. Get started with internet and advanced security for $49.99 a month for 12 months with a two-year agreement. Plus, for a limited time only, ask how new and existing customers can get a free line of unlimited mobile during the Mobile Made Free event. Call or go online today to learn more. Ends 9-21-2023. Eco bill and auto pay required. New 50 megabits per second internet and security edge customers only. Equipment, taxes, and fees extra. Mobile offer requires 100 megabits per second internet package and new unlimited intro mobile service. Other restrictions apply. My brother-in-law died suddenly, and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10-year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. Then we called SelectQuote. SelectQuote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month, a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, SelectQuote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, call SelectQuote at 1-800-330-1991. That's 1-800-330-1991 or go to selectquote.com. That's 1-800-330-1991. SelectQuote. We shop, you save. 
Full details on example policies at selectquo.com slash commercials. Even before the pandemic, one in five American adults experienced some form of mental illness, depression, suicide, prescription opioid misuse. Utah isn't immune to our share of challenges, but there is hope. We need to take action to keep our loved ones safe. That's why KSL has teamed with the University of Utah Huntsman Mental Health Institute to bring you hope and help you thrive. It's Healthy Mind Matters. Find out more at HealthyMindMatters.com. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bomas. First, police are asking the public to stay away from 7800 South and the new Bingham Highway area because of a plane crash. One person died when a single-engine plane went down near the South Valley Regional Airport. Second, the Utah Pride Center has laid off staff and suspended its programs for September while it tries to deal with what it calls massive financial turmoil. And third, 10 people were aboard a business jet that crashed north of Moscow today, reportedly including Yevgeny Prigozhin, the Wagner Group mercenary chief. Right now, 84 degrees, partly cloudy in Salt Lake City. Back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Get deeper insights on the news from Inside Sources. Welcome back to Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. It's great to be with you today, as always. And as we look at a few things going on, some interesting things uh, coming to the state of Utah. In fact, uh, last night, the Republican uh, Senate Minority Leader, Mitch McConnell, and his wife, former Secretary of Transportation and Former Secretary of Labor Elaine Chow uh, were here in the Beehive State. Uh, they attended an event put on by the Orangey Hatch Foundation. Uh, the event was to honor uh, this couple. They really are a power couple's power couple in our nation's capital. Uh, and they received from the Hatch Foundation the uh, Titan of Service Award, honoring their long careers in public service to the American people. And I wanted to touch on just a, a couple of things uh, from uh, Leader McConnell and from uh, Secretary Chow that I thought were most interesting. It was also uh, really a fascinating conversation over the course of the evening. Uh, former Oregon Senator Gordon Smith uh, introduced the couple. Uh, he described them as the uh, the power couple in the power city. And uh, here's the way he introduced them to the audience uh, here in Utah last night. That when you go to Washington, D.C., there's probably no couple um, in many of our lifetimes who are a greater power couple in the power city than Mitch McConnell and Elaine Chow. They are truly historic public servants and are, are certainly owing due this Titan Award. So thank you for being here tonight. Uh, Secretary Chow uh, began by reflecting on her relationship with the late Senator Orrin Hatch, how they worked together uh, during their time, uh, their crossover time there uh, in government. I worked with Senator Hatch for eight years when I was Secretary of Labor. He was unfailingly smart, strategic, effective, and he was a tremendous ally to have uh, when I was in the administration. I'm very humbled, very honored to remember Orrin Hatch, a great American, great patriot. It was interesting that at the outset of the program, Matt Sangren, of course, who we regularly have on this program, he's the executive director of the Orange E. Hatch Foundation, Talked about Secretary Chow, I think, in some important terms, in terms of uh, her experience, her story. Uh, Sangren said, uh, only in a nation like ours could an eight-year-old who arrived in the United States not knowing a word of English become the 18th U.S. Secretary of Transportation and the 24th U.S. Secretary of Labor. Only in a nation like ours could the son of an Army veteran uh, whose bout with polio as a young boy nearly bankrupted his family, grow up to become the longest-serving Senate leader of either party in American history. And I think those are pretty apt uh, descriptions of both Secretary Chow and Leader McConnell. And uh, later in the program, Secretary Chow talked a little bit more about her beginning, again, coming to the shores of the United States as an 8-year-old, not understanding a word of English, but she actually went back one step further and talked about her parents and their commitment to get to America from China. Take a listen. My father became one of the youngest sea captains at the age of 29, but he was away at sea for 10 months out of the year. And he took a national examination and had a chance to go abroad to study. And where do you think he wanted to go? America, of course. 
He went first, and it took him three years before he was able to bring my mother, two sisters, and me to America. He left my mother when she was uh, seven months pregnant with their third child, not knowing when they would be reunited. Secretary Chow also went on to describe how they are just one of millions who have had very similar stories coming from all different points on the compass all around the world. Sacrifice of family, uh, often one parent uh, or one member of a family coming ahead to kind of pave the way and others coming along as they could afford it and make uh, the necessary arrangements. Uh, And that is part of the American story. It's a part of our fabric. And if you think about that, uh, yes, we can talk about all of the challenges and the dysfunction that we have in government, in our communities, in society as a whole, and we have plenty. But there aren't very many places on this planet where someone could show up in a country as an eight-year-old not speaking a word of English uh, and ultimately become uh, both uh, at different times Secretary of Labor and Secretary of Transportation. Uh, That is what the American dream is all about. And that is something to celebrate. It's something that the Hatch Foundation celebrated very well last night in delivering this uh, Titan of Service Award, uh, both to Secretary Chow and then also to Senator McConnell. Uh, Senator McConnell spent uh, his part uh, of the evening, a conversation they had there with uh, former Senator Smith, uh, reflecting on America's involvement in the war in Ukraine. There's also a growing view on much in my party, regretfully, that somehow we're wasting our time in Ukraine. So let me just say something about that. First of all, the number of American personnel we've lost in Ukraine is zero. Putin has already lost. He's lost because NATO is bigger, more united. I do think that uh, we get impatient with wars, but this is not our war. We're, We're helping friends of ours trying to prevent their country from being taken over. A force. Uh, so some really interesting policy discussions in the context of uh, the story of uh, Leader McConnell and Secretary Chow. Uh, again, it was just a very interesting conversation back and forth uh, as they were there on the stage last night receiving this Titan uh, in uh, Service Award uh, from the Hatch Foundation. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of very important principles uh, came out in the context of that in terms of how do you navigate Uh, difficult situations? How do you navigate uh, dealing with uh, a lot of the challenges that come from trying to govern uh, often in the midst of division? Uh, And uh, there are a lot of things that people can disagree about, uh, but there's one thing that you you just have to step back and say, wow, that's pretty amazing. Uh, It's quite an amazing story uh, and quite an amazing legacy. And uh, as always, the Hatch Foundation uh, pulled off an extraordinary event focused on principles leading to policy and elevated conversations. And we always appreciate the Hatch Foundation for leading out and making that happen and for them uh, bringing Secretary Chow and Leader McConnell to the Beehive State uh, last night for what was uh, an important evening, an important discussion uh, on a host of things and and a good example of public service, what that looks like and uh, how we can all do our part to help move the country uh, and move freedom forward. That's really the bottom line there. All right. Uh, Well, we've had a uh, rapid fire first hour here on Inside Sources. And as we uh, round out hour number one, uh, we're going to get ready for hour number two and we're going to pick up our conversation. We started the show at 105 talking about some of the players on the debate stage tonight in the Republican primary trying to become the nominee for president. When we start off at the uh, 205 slot, uh, we're going to go back to that conversation. We'll talk about the rest of the candidates running. So we'll have eight on the stage tonight. We'll talk about each of them, tell you what their strategy is, why it matters, what you should be listening for. So stick around. More Inside Sources coming up on KSL News Radio after Top of the Hour News. KSL FM Midvale, KSL Salt Lake City. Listen on the KSL News Radio app and in your car at 102.7 FM. KSL News Radio, your all day companion for news. It's 2 o'clock at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bomas. KSL's top story this hour one person has died in a plane crash in West Jordan this afternoon. The FAA says the pilot was the only person aboard the single engine plane. It went down near the South Valley Regional Airport, and police are asking the public to steer clear of the area around New Bingham Road, Airport Road, and the Copper Hills Parkway at 7800 South. 
A, a single engine plane crashed today in the Cedar Valley area of western Utah County. There were two people aboard. The Utah County Sheriff's Office says nobody there was injured. Utah Pride Center has laid off staff and suspended its programs for September while it tries to reorganize to stay in business. An email to media says the remaining leadership team acknowledges the disappointment and outrage of the community, but says the massive financial turmoil there is not new. The statement says the center could eventually close, revive, or reset. Our top national story this hour from ABC News. The name of Wagner mercenary chief Yevgeny Prigozhin was on the flight manifest for a plane that crashed north of Moscow with 10 people on board. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge says Prigozhin had been a uh, Vladimir Putin ally for decades, but things changed in June. President Putin went on TV and said that the Wagner Group, he didn't name Prigozhin at the time personally, but he said the Wagner Group were traitors. Then there was a kind of backroom deal reportedly. We think that Putin, the Kremlin, cut a deal with Wagner and Prigozhin. Then we got reports that Prigozhin had gone off to Belarus. We last saw him popping up in Africa in Mali. Now we're getting this incident. It appears at the moment that Prigozhin might have met a horrible death. Your money at this moment, the uh, Dow Jones average, uh, up 185 points on the day so far, but the NASDAQ also up strongly 215 points near the close of trading. And on the way, we'll be looking at uh, another uh, couple of days of storms before it's all over. That's next. KSL News Time 202. This summer, the political season heats up. By August, it'll be time for debates. Can you believe it? We're planning coverage of the real issues, the important stories that impact how we live. Listen each morning from 5 to 9 on KSL News Radio. Hey, Derek Overstreet here from the New Millennium Group, financial advisors in Utah. You know, I've been helping people retire in the state of Utah for the last 20 years. The way we do that is we actually find out what is important to you. We create a step-by-step -step plan that takes into consideration your income, your debt, whether you want money from real estate, stock market, annuities, life insurance, whatever. If you want to deal with professionals, people that are fiduciaries and have a legal responsibility and obligation to do what's in your best interest, give my team a call at 888-999-6370. That's 888-999-6370. Or go to my website, utahsfinancialplanner.com. If you'd like to retire three to five years before you thought it was possible, give my team a call right now. 888-999-6370. That's 888-999-6370. Here is what I'm not buying. A bounce house, a paddle board, a dump trailer, tables and chairs for a party, a 3D printer. I'm not buying them because I'm renting them unutilized. Utilize is the app where you can rent almost anything, and you can rent out almost anything. Scroll through the Utilize app, and you'll see kayaks, VR headsets, baby carrier backpacks, balloon arches, power tools, I mean almost anything. And renting is so easy, so local, and so much cheaper than buying stuff that sits in your garage. You need it, you rent it. And if you have stuff you don't use every day, rent it out on Utilize. I talked to one woman in Lehigh who rents out 80 different items that just sit around her house. It's an income stream. Imagine the possibility you can rent a sound system for a party, rent an e-bike for an adventure, need a tool for your DIY project, utilize. Now it's spelled different, Y-O-O-D-L-I-Z-E, utilize. Download the app and get a $20 credit when you use the code KSL. Utilize, Y-O-O-D-L-I-Z-E, it's in your app store. Gillette Heating and Air Conditioning is offering spring air conditioner tune-ups for only $59. Call 801-425-4500 to schedule today. A carrier factory authorized dealer. Traffic and weather together brought to you by Granite Credit Union's High Yield Savings Certificates. Here's Ricky Meese. A KSL traffic trooper reporting trouble in traffic 7th East, 4100 South. Traffic is being blocked and diverted in the area. And heads up, West Jordan drivers, you need to avoid this area due to uh, an investigation and police activity. Copper Hills Parkway and 7800 South Airport Road travel in the area is expected to remain closed to drivers for several hours. 
With over 30 plus specialties and multiple locations across Utah, Revere has you covered for all your health needs. Revere Health, your partner in health, your partner for life. Online at reverehealth.com. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. KSL weather, chance of isolated thunderstorms stays in the forecast through Friday. Highs in the upper 80s, then will dry out and warm up into the 90s this weekend. Right now, 84 degrees and uh, partly cloudy at KSL News Radio, 102.7 FM, 1160 AM, and KSLNewsRadio.com. Your all day companion for news. Inside Sources. Inside, Inside Sources. America's Voice of Reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. We started the show today by highlighting four of the presidential candidates that will be on the debate stage later on tonight in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as the Republicans battle to figure out who their nominee will be for president of the United States. But we've got some more candidates to highlight here on Inside Sources. We'll look at the strengths, the weaknesses, and what these presidential hopefuls have to do beyond just trying to get a headline tonight. Let's begin. Think you know the news of the day? Think again with Boyd Matheson on KSL News Radio. Sadly, we've really boiled down our debates to who can have the pithiest quote or who can get the best jab or counter jab in. And that's really not what debates should be about. It really should be about telling your story, painting a picture of what uh, your ruling or governing would look like, how you make decisions, and what kind of character you have. Uh, interesting, if you missed earlier in the show, uh, we had John Curtis on talking about this idea of, look, we've got to get back to character and voting that character matters. So some interesting things to look at there. As we go through each of the candidates, uh, we always want to look at what are their strengths, what do they have to be careful of, and what's their strategy? What does winning look like them for tonight? Uh, and so uh, let's uh, begin with uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, and that is the proper pronunciation. We've done the quadruple check on that. And uh, he, of course, has a very interesting campaign that has some momentum. He's got some energy, to be sure. And he talked earlier this week about his focus to restore proper governance to our elected officials and uh, get past just the big deep state of agencies and uh, control by the swamp and the Washington establishment. What does it mean to be an American? It means we believe in this radical dream that our founding fathers had 250 years ago. A radical dream that I have as a citizen today that the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government, not the deep state managerial bureaucracy. So it'll be fascinating to watch tonight to see what Vivek does in terms of can he stay disciplined and restraint enough uh, to not get over his skis, as we like to say, uh, to get so caught up in the moment that you start going down a, a path and soon you're saying things that uh, could undermine your credibility as a candidate or could undermine the confidence and trust people have in your campaign. Uh, and so I think that will be the test uh, for uh, Mr. Ramaswamy uh, is that he's going to have to be controlled. He's going to have to hit where he can, uh, but again, not get over the skis and try to do too much. You don't have to do it all in the first debate. You just got to prove you're credible. You got to prove that you have a, a position to stand on and that you have a vision of where you're going. That's the most important thing. Uh, next, let's look at Nick, Nikki Haley. Of course, Nikki Haley was one of the first to get into the race. And as you look at her experience, of course, foreign affairs is going to be a big part of any conversation with Nikki Haley. She spoke in an interview earlier about foreign policy and why we have to change the game when it comes to being tough on China. Let's talk about the fact that we shouldn't be dependent on our medicines from China. We should not be selling them land and we should be taking back the land they've already purchased. We should make sure we get that infiltration out of our universities. We should make sure that we stop selling them technology that's actually building up their military that they're using to threaten America. This is not the time for the U.S. to be scared of China. We are going to become strong and independent on our own and do whatever it takes to keep Americans safe. I think the real key for Nikki Haley tonight is not only to be able to be strong in the foreign affairs. She will. She'll be very strong on China. She'll be very strong on comments around Ukraine and security and the border. Uh, she'll do very well in those spaces. What Nikki Haley has to do is to string that together into some sort of vision. Uh, she's, she's really good in compartmentalized content. 
So she can talk about Ukraine and go deep. China, go deep. She can talk about a lot of her experience as a governor or at the UN and go deep. But she has yet painted this picture and connected the dots for the American people in terms of what her goal really is. What is that vision? So I think a little more vision from Nikki Haley is what winning would look like for her tonight. Not just good, not just good foreign policy bullet points, uh, but a real vision for the country and what her leadership would look like in the Oval Office. All right, let's turn now to Ron DeSantis, of course, uh, who is in a lot of the national polls, uh, polling at number two in most of those. Things are starting to get mixed up a little bit in places like Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. Uh, he, of course, uh, came in with a lot of promise, had a very stumbling start. And so tonight, I think for Ron DeSantis, has to be the uh, both stop the bleeding and pivot to the positive. So Ron DeSantis has got to show, especially those big donors who have been funding his campaign, to show that he can be very presidential, that he can look like he belongs in the job and on the stage, and that he can then parlay that into some real sustainable momentum moving forward. Uh, earlier this week, uh, he highlighted his record in the state of Florida and promised to deliver similar results to the American people. At the end of the day, it's what are we delivering for the people that have put us into office? And in the state of Florida, I can say uh, that I have delivered more for America First principles than anybody else in the country. Uh, our voters want us to stand on principle and fight for them. So, again, I think with Ron DeSantis, it's this interesting balance. We talked about it earlier as it relates uh, to Doug Burgum and his time as governor of North Dakota. You can only talk about your home state for so long, and then you have to broaden it out. You have to keep applying it to this is what it means if you live in Chicago, and this is what it means if you live in Milwaukee, and this is what you, it means if you live in uh, South Carolina and so on. And the other big thing for Ron DeSantis, winning tonight looks like uh, being presidential, and connecting. He has to have some moments where he is vulnerable, where he shares some of his personal story, maybe some of the things that he's worried about or things he's frustrated about so that there can be a little bit more of that human connection uh, because that will be a big, important piece of the puzzle for Ron DeSantis moving forward. Finally, Mike Pence, former vice president, uh, will be on the stage, and his is a complicated task, being the former vice president uh, his former boss, the former president, Donald Trump, will not be on the stage, but is a candidate. Uh, so he has a lot of things to navigate there. I, I think the, uh, the most compelling components, I think, to Mike Pence uh, is his humility, his understanding of what matters in the country. Uh, and I think he's going to have to get to that element in a happy warrior kind of way. Uh, not stern, not glum, not gloomy, uh, but hopeful. And then he's got to lay out why he has that kind of hope in the future of the country. Uh, he recently spoke at the conservative conference in Atlanta, and he gave his strategy for what he talks about in the context of restoring America's economic power here at home. Look, I think America is the leader of the free world, but everything begins with American strength at home. Our plan is to restore the American economy, I mean, literally to achieve energy independence again. And frankly, a nation without borders is not a nation. We've got to secure the southern border of the United States of America again, and we will. We did it before under our administration. At the end of the day, we, we've got to be strong at home so we can be strong in the future. So I think for Mike Pence, it is about reintroducing himself to the American people in a different role as being the lead role, not being the vice president. And so that's a tricky task uh, to do for sure. But I think there are some, there will be some moments of opportunity, I believe, for Mike Pence tonight uh, to talk about integrity, to talk about character, to talk about putting constitution uh, over personalities or politicians. So I do think he has some moments of opportunity where people can can uh, gain that vision of okay, this this is different, uh, and what what could this actually look like if he were at the helm? So all of these to say, as we look at Milwaukee tonight, as you listen. Uh, as I always say, when you listen to a debate, uh, make sure you're listening for specifics over sweeping generalities. What are the candidates for? Not just what they are against. Do When they talk about their vision, is it a vision of themselves in the Oval Office behind the Resolute Desk? 
Or when they talk about that vision, does it cause you to think about your life, your family, your world, and your future? Uh, All of those are things that we should be listening for, and we do have to listen a little different. It's not just about zingers and one-liners and gotcha questions. It's not about what can be reposted on social media. We're, We're not selecting someone to be an influencer. We're actually selecting someone to lead the free world and to be president of the United States of America. So it requires us as voters to listen different and then vote different. We'll be right back. Think again on Inside Sources with Boyd Matheson. When the day's almost done. Another day, another dollar. There's the drive home. (sighs) Put Jeff Kaplan in the passenger seat. Hey, how's it going? Um, good, thanks. You're in my car. Yep, let me catch you up. Jeff has traffic and weather together every 10 minutes on the nines, breaking stories, and his signature minute of news. It's like Jeff's there just for you. This is a little awkward. Isn't it great? Jeff Kaplan's Afternoon News, 3 to 7 on KSL News Radio. Be advised, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to save 40 to 80% on a hot tub and swim spa this weekend only, Friday through Sunday, Mountain America Expo Center Sandy. Be advised, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to save 40 to 80% on a hot tub and swim spa this weekend only, Friday through Sunday, Mountain America Expo Center Sandy. 18 month interest free financing. Our factories have demanded we sell 1,000 hot tubs and swim spas this weekend. Mountain America Expo Center Sandy. Huge factory incentives, factory rebates this weekend only. Mountain America Expo Center Sandy. We can remove your old hot tub. Free delivery of your new hot tub. Hot tub starting at $2,999. Mountain America Expo Center Sandy. Free delivery of your new hot tub. Just relax and enjoy. Mountain America Expo Center Sandy. Friday, noon to 8 p.m. Saturday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Sunday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Free admission, free parking, free delivery. Mountain America Expo Center Sandy. Call 833-SPA-SALE or visit hottubandswimspasale.com. Swing a loop for excitement at Beatty Days 2023, Friday, October 27th through the 30th. It's a weekend of fun with Old West Shootouts, the ICS Chili Cook-Off, 2K 5K Race, live music, bed races, a desert art show, classic car show, a cornhole toss, model railroads, vendors, and contests for everyone. Just 95 miles from Las Vegas. It's Beatty Days, October 27th through the 30th. Discover the Old West at its best. Visit BeattyNevada.org. Are you or someone you take care of as their caregiver living with Alzheimer's disease? This study just might be for you. Consider participating in a theorist clinical trial exploring a novel repair and regenerative approach to Alzheimer's disease. Pantheon Clinical Research in Salt Lake City is looking for people with mild to moderate dementia, 55 to 85 years old. A consistent caregiver or support person is necessary for the conduct of this study. This study is a late-stage clinical study of an investigational drug for the treatment of mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. Pantheon Clinical Research has over 30 years' experience with clinical trials. They conduct their business with professionalism, efficiency, and integrity. Contact Pantheon Clinical Research in Salt Lake City today. Again, call Pantheon Clinical Research today at 385-281-0550. That's 385-281-0550. Or go to PantheonClinical.com. That's PantheonClinical.com. They say good things come to those who wait, but we both know the truth. If you want the good things in life, you've got to go out and get them. So if you've been dreaming of a Cadillac, don't wait. Head to Jerry Signer Cadillac and get one for yourself. With their award-winning XT4, 5, and 6 models available on-site and the area's top selection of certified pre-owned Cadillacs, there's no need to wait to drive in luxury. Stop dreaming. Start driving. Visit Jerry Signer and experience the Signer difference. Summer is upon us, and do you know what your lawn wants? It wants Revive Organic Soil Treatment upon it. A Revive treatment with fertilization, aeration, and good watering is the key to building stronger roots for a healthy, lush green lawn all summer. Revive fertilizes and moves water and nutrients deeper into the soil. You'll see the difference. Revive is surefire defense against summer drought and skyrocketing water costs. Make the most of your watering with Revive Organic Soil Treatment. Apply Revive Organic Soil Treatment today. It works. Getting help with electrical repairs is easier than you think. All you have to do is call Any Hour Services or schedule an appointment at anyhourservices.com. No one helps more homeowners than Any Hour Services. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bombas. First, 
The pilot of a light plane died when it crashed near the airport in West Jordan this afternoon. Second, the Utah Pride Center has laid off many of its staff members while the leadership tries to reorganize to keep it in business. Third, the mercenary group leader who challenged Russia's military leadership was listed among the passengers of a plane that crashed between Moscow and St. Petersburg. 84 degrees right now in Salt Lake City. And back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Hear elevated conversation on crucial issues. Boyd Matheson on Inside Sources. We are really pleased to have back on the show Amity Slays, the author of four different New York Times bestsellers. We're a big fan, of course, of Coolidge on this show. Uh, and Amity, just so you know, we've we've officially made him the patron saint of Inside Sources here on KSL. And uh, we know that uh, you chair the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. And he's just been popping up in a lot of interesting places and spaces uh, over the last little while, and it just keeps us coming back to, wow, he really had some interesting things figured out that uh, we maybe ought to expect from our presidents once again. Uh, we actually started looking at uh, President Biden's response uh, to what was happening in Maui with the fires, uh, and uh, interesting Olivier Knox uh, from the Washington Post uh, kind of went through uh, Calvin Coolidge's uh, interaction with some natural disasters and kind of a trend that that set. But uh, from your historic perspective, as it relates to Coolidge, uh, give us a little bit of the behind the scenes there. The thing about Coolidge's disaster, which was the flood of the Mississippi, a great flood, was he didn't go. Hmm. The president didn't go. People were angry. Well, if it were his state, he would go. But there was a giant disaster. And then there was a kind of almost biblical level of retribution because then there was a flood where he came from, New England, Vermont. So the question was, would Coolidge go to the disaster in the state he was born in? Coolidge didn't go there either. Mm. Wow, a president who doesn't go home to his town when there's a disaster in his town. But Coolidge was making a point, which is he's not president of Vermont. He's president of the United States. And in President Coolidge's view, in the 1920s, Well, this wasn't the federal government's responsibility, and he was quite wary of the precedent he would Mm. set by presenting as big rescuer from Washington and what that meant in terms of the budget and federal spending. So what a contrast. Yeah, and and I I love that contrast because I, I think it's important for us on so many levels, not just when there's a big disaster. Uh, we have sort of dubbed the presidents to be the consoler in chief and to do all of those kinds of things. Uh, but I want you to dig in just a little bit because I, I do think Coolidge's approach to to federalism and the fact that we shouldn't be looking to Washington to solve all the problems. There are things that have to be done right there at home. Uh, how you, how do you see that playing out, uh, not just in disaster relief, but in other spaces where maybe a little return to Coolidge might be actually good for the nation? Well, I'm remembering that one of the papers, probably the Times, said, kind of backed him up and said, we can't expect an all-fathering federal government. The federal government is not dad. And Coolidge had that view. And what he was really talking about was the responsibilities of the states. This is happening in your states. He believed in states. States at the time were bigger presence in the U.S. economy than the federal government was. The federal government was a pygmy, accepting Mm -hmm. more relative to states. And there's something about that that's very American and very important to us because how our states lead teaches us, um, one, they're better at leading because they're closer to the problem. The federal government is awful far and sends the wrong thing. And uh, the other is when states lead differently, they give us a chance to evaluate which response is better, even as we recently saw in COVID. Right, right. One state, Florida acts one way, South Dakota acts another way, New York acts another way. Which was the right policy on ventilators? Mm. The, The experiment wasn't perfect because New York had COVID early. But nonetheless, there's a huge amount of learning when you have the the uh, flowers bloom differently yeah. you know, uh, that uh, and that's our our framers understood that uh, to me Coolidge's virtue um, is that he's a bridge to the framers he's a modern founder because he had a very clear and sophisticated understanding of the framers documents and their intentions and then he showed that the framers principles weren't some sort of granny museum 
cast in amber thing we can look at and say, oh, but that is no application today. He showed in a very modern age with radio, cars, airplanes, that the framers principles could work for America. Mm. One of the things that I've been going back to with Coolidge of late is this this counterpoint uh, to the hubris that we often see in people in the presidency these days and the humility that that Coolidge clearly had uh, for the office, but for the states and for the and for the people. I uh, I just kept chuckling the other day to to read that Coolidge's funeral was only 22 minutes long. <laughs> that it was two hymns and a uh, no eulogy. And to me, that kind of pointed to this whole idea of hey, the the founders had it right in terms of where we should be looking for solutions. Uh, and it wasn't you know who could uh, appear on every cable news network or uh, you know fly in on Air Force One. Uh, to make a, a big photo op uh, to try to console folks. It was, no, let's do what Americans do best and actually lean into this uh, and actually solve it, as you said, with a, a wide variety of things that we can then evaluate. You don't want to be backed into a, a corner where you're presented as inhumane, which is what happens nowadays. You're not sending money. You don't care about dead people. And Coolidge confronted that, too. The humorist Will Rogers had a suggestion, people are dying what, you're not doing anything? And Coolidge said, no, it's the states who should be doing things. And, it, and, and there's a small part of America that dies when we, over a long time, make the federal government responsible for everything. It, we infantilize ourselves. Mm. So I think that's very interesting. We made a Coolidge movie, which I hope we can show in your state um, of one hour and the opening is at Rushmore because it so happened that Coolidge was contemplating the presidency and whether he should run again in the summer of 1927. And it also happened that that summer, the summer White House, they used to have this, was he'd established it in Rapid City, not that far from Rushmore. He stayed at the Custer Game Lodge. So he saw that the sculptor Guts and Borglum was Cutting these great busts, what does the sculptor want? An appropriation, obviously. And Coolidge <laughs> gave a little talk up there. But Coolidge, I am sure, also, I know, was also thinking about how to go out as a president and what model his presidency could give America. He had a chance to run again the following year. He was thinking about that. He had been elected only once in 1924. There was no problem with him running again. And he was so wildly popped that Guts and Borglum, I think closer to seriously than we can imagine, suggested that Coolidge ought to be up on Rushmore, too, one way or the other, mm. if you can believe it, <laughs> given Coolidge's reputation. Now, and Coolidge did bless Rushmore, but he decided that he was going to be more like George Washington than Theodore Roosevelt, to name two fellows up there. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, he wasn't going to outstay his welcome and trash his party's policy. So around the same time he visited the beginning of Rushmore, he handed out notices that he would not run again in 28, even though he was popular. And believe me, the Republican Party did not say, what a great man, just like Washington. They were furious at him because he had long coattails. Yeah. They were incomprehending. And it took a long time for this, this recognition to settle in. That was a stunning effort. And what Coolidge said soon after when he wrote his autobiography, is it's a great advantage to a president and a great safety to the country for the president to know he is not a great man. He's a humble servant. Mm -hmm. Office matters more than man, and he's going to leave office because staying in office too long makes him, and here I paraphrase, something like a king. Mm -hmm. And we have that problem bad today. We think all presidents are kings. Yeah. Oh. You no. Know, with successions or long stays, you know. So I find his legacy so carefully crafted by him stunning. Mm. He chose to leave when he didn't have to. Very hard to do. We're going to stay with a conversation with Amity Slays. Uh, chair, she chairs the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. Uh, we have much more to talk about, including the IRS, political parties, what comes next for the nation? Stick around. This is an important conversation here on KSL News Radio. We'll be right back.
It's 2.30 at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bonas. KSL's top story this hour. One person has died in a plane crash in West Jordan this afternoon. The FAA says the pilot was the only person aboard the single-engine plane. It went down on the uh, Copper Hills Parkway at about 7,800 south near the South Valley Regional Airport, and police are asking uh, drivers to steer clear of that area. Our top national story this hour... The leader of the Wagner Mercenary Group listed among the passengers of a plane that crashed north of Moscow. Yevgeny Prigozhin led a rebellion against uh, the Russian military leadership after he became unhappy uh, with how the war in Ukraine was being managed. He was persuaded to call off that rebellion, though, when his troops were halfway to Moscow. There's an active shooter situation going on in a Pittsburgh neighborhood today. It involves homes being evacuated. And ABC's Derek Dennis reports. Pittsburgh police say the suspect turned violent and started shooting when deputies arrived to serve an eviction notice. Two drones were reportedly shot down and hundreds of rounds were believed fired. An emergency dispatcher heard on broadcastify giving responding officers a heads up. We have an active shooter situation zone five. Actors pulled up in the house with gasoline threatening to burn the house down. No officers were shot, but officials say some were injured by broken glass. Nearby homes forced to evacuate. Derek Dennis, ABC News. Your money at this moment. The uh, Dow Jones average closing the trading day up 184 points. And the NASDAQ up 215 points at the close. The S&P 500 was up 48 points. And our KSL weather, we're uh, going to see a few more thunderstorms before it's all done. That's next. KSL News Time 231. Early mornings can be hard enough just getting yourself going. We try to make it a little easier with news and weather from comfortable, trusted anchors and reporters. Join us on Utah's Morning News between 5 and 9 on KSL News Radio. America's largest producer of gun shows, Crossroads of the West, comes to the Davis Conference Center in Layton this weekend. Check it out. Awesome selection. Awesome, yeah, just a lot more than I expected to see. Yeah, it's great. Crossroads of the West Gun Show this Saturday and Sunday at the Davis Conference Center in Layton from 9 to 5 on Saturday and 9 to 4 on Sunday. Your ticket is good both days. We'll scour through, find the best bar, and come back and buy it. The quality at this particular show is extremely high, and the prices have been very fair. Hundreds of tables for everyone, from the once-a-year hunter to the avid collector. Crossroads features new and used guns and ammo, gun safes, reloading supplies, knives, hunting equipment, scopes, accessories, and more. I'll just tell my friends to come out here tomorrow. Check it out. This Saturday and Sunday, the Crossroads of the West Gun Show. This is the big one. Now coming to the Davis Conference Center in Layton, where you can buy, sell, and trade at all Crossroads gun shows. If they don't have it here, they don't have it. Have you Googled yourself lately? Are there negative posts from an ex-employee or from a former client? Maybe an outdated news article or sensitive personal information about your family? Search engines don't always get it right. For right or wrong, it's your reputation on the line. That's where Reputation Defender by Norton comes in. One of the most trusted names in online reputation repair. Reputation Defender has been fixing people's search results for over 15 years. Their cutting-edge approaches help you to wipe away unwanted information in your search results. They also promote the good stuff so that it rises to the top, helping you put your best foot forward. Your good name is too valuable to leave to the whims of a Google algorithm. Take control with Reputation Defender. You can start by getting your free Reputation Report Card at reputationdefender.com or call 800-401-6681 to speak to an expert. That's 800-401-6681. With our roots in Northern Utah, Holy Cross Hospital has a legacy of caring to help every person be whole and healthy. Find us at five Holy Cross Hospital locations and more than 45 clinics along the Wasatch Front. Learn more at holycrossutah.org. At Holy Cross Hospital, we're honored to carry the legacy of our namesake and equally honored to care for Northern Utah's vibrant communities. Find us at five Holy Cross Hospital locations and more than 45 clinics along the Wasatch Front. Learn more at holycrossutah.org. If this were a Reese's TV ad, you'd be staring at a Reese's peanut butter cup. And sure, my voice is peanut buttery smooth, but still, you need to see the peanut butter cups, right? No? I can really just say Reese's and you'll go get some? (laughs) Okay, Reese's. 
Reese's. Reese's. Really working, actually. Reese's. Reese's. This, I'm on to something. Reese's. 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 Traffic and weather together brought to you by Granite Credit Union's High Yield Savings Certificates. Here's Ricky Meese. A multiple vehicle crash with a lot of debris and uh, you're going to see left lanes blocked northbound I-15. This just happened as you're approaching the 6th south exit into downtown and traffic is really starting to slow down. And then, of course, due to the continuing investigation, roads will remain closed for several hours due to the fatal airplane crash at 7800 South Airport Road and Copper Hills Park. Way. When it comes to trusted, affordable auto care, nobody does it better than Burt Brothers Tire and Service. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. KSL weather, chance of isolated thunderstorms stays in the forecast through Friday. Highs in the upper 80s and then will dry out and warm up into the 90s this weekend. Right now, 85 degrees, partly cloudy at KSL News Radio. 102.7 FM, 1160 AM and kslnewsradio.com, your all-day companion for news. Inside Sources. Inside Sources. America's voice of reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. If you're just joining us, we have Amy Slade uh, on the line with us today, uh, and uh, she chairs the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation uh, she's a national best-selling author multiple times, uh, one of the great thinkers. And uh, we're going to stay with the conversation because we want to get to something uh, that uh, you published today uh, in uh, National Review and uh, also has some very interesting Coolidge-esque ties to it, I think, as it comes to the IRS. I, I know Coolidge would often say that uh, the IRS, what taxation like that was uh, legalized uh, largely, I think was the, the way he liked to frame that. Uh, but some interesting things, and, uh, of course, it gets into the politics of the day, but uh, give us some perspective there. Well, it's interesting. Coolidge called overtaxation legalized larceny. That's a strong phrase. Why? Because you're impugning the motives of the tax authorities, really, or you're saying you're stealing from people. You're saying you're criminals. Mm. Well, it's not very often we call the government criminals, <laughs> right? It's it's kind of a radical thing to do. Yeah. I think he wasn't attacking the precursors to the IRS authorities personally. He was saying the government commits legalized larceny when it overtaxes. And that's fairly aggressive. The issue in this column is everyone's debating about the IRS, and there were some IRS whistleblowers who told the public that they thought the Hunter Biden case wasn't being taken seriously enough. That is whatever tax abuses Hunter Biden may have committed. And the Republicans got on that argument because, well, President Trump and a lot of other Republicans are being assailed for, you know, being caught in the tax snare. And what I try to get at in this National Review article, which is called Wrong Target, is the IRS is just the instrument. It's the player, not the game. Yeah. You know, something's wrong with the game. And what's wrong with the game is the code. And yet Republicans won't go anywhere near it, just in the way they won't go anywhere near really the budget problem. Uh, And in in Coolidge's case, he he was pretty clear. The income tax was young then, but it was enforced. And his solution was not to kill the IRS and so on, um, or to, to vilify various revenue men. It was to simplify the code so citizens weren't so vulnerable to the mood of bureaucrats, authorities who might decide their tax returns were right or wrong or halfway between, weren't reliant the way we must be nowadays on on accountants, on lawyers to handle tax matters. The real problem was the code. The code needs to be clear. And it all boils down to trust. The reason I like Coolidge, I'm just writing a speech about Coolidge. And the reason I like Coolidge is that he did what he said he would so people would trust him. Even voters who didn't agree with his opinion on the top marginal tax rate, which he brought down to 25 percent lower than Ronald Reagan's, saw that he intended to do what he said. He did it and he, he did it in a fair way. You know, you like someone who does what he says, even if you don't agree with the goal or the means. And that's why Coolidge was so popular. So I I, I really do think the Republicans have lost their way. Uh, It's not their fault. 
entirely. If you wake up every morning thinking you might be indicted, it's hard to be lofty about tax reform. And when you have no allies across the aisle or even compromisers across the aisle to work with you, well, then, well, the idea of tax reform is reasonable, is humorous, Mm -hmm. not reality. So that's not their fault. One of the people who mocked Andy Biggs, it was of Arizona, for praising the IRS whistleblowers was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She said, you know, gee, every other day you want to you make the IRS your target, and now you're praising those IRS whistleblowers because that's politically expedient to you. And she was right on that. But another thing about her is she advocates very high tax rates on the wealthy, and it would be hard to imagine a compromise with such a lawmaker from um, a small government conservative. It just isn't going to happen. She's no Dan Rostenkowski to mention one of the lawmakers on the Democratic side, a yeah. Dan Rostenkowski of Illinois, who is so key to tax reform in the past. There are not enough centrist Democrats, and there's not enough goodwill and enough trust or even enough willingness to examine the problem because the people of goodwill, whatever their party, are act, would be actually fairly close if they looked at the tax problems or the budget problems yeah. and the debt problems. Yeah, and, and I'm so glad you linked all of those together because I, I think it's the exact same thing uh, when it comes to the, the spending, the debt, the deficits, uh, that uh, a lot of people are, are willing to, to shoot at, at other people, other politicians or, or other lawmakers, uh, but they're not uh, interested in getting at the game and uh, really getting at how do we actually do that, whether it's the, the code uh, as it relates to taxes, whether it's the actual budgeting process uh, that's supposed to be done. And, of course, we'll watch the drama of that unfold again when we uh, get past Labor Day and we'll have another shutdown showdown on the horizon, I'm sure. Uh, just to, to finish off, Amity, uh, I'm so... Uh, focus on this idea of trust. Uh, obviously, it's diminished in presidency, it's diminished in Congress, it's diminished in the Supreme Court. Uh, and I'm fearful that uh, that's starting to, to unravel in even all the way down to the trust we have in our neighbors and in our communities. Oh, oh, completely. I mean, you look at if your neighbor all day long listens to one radio show, which says the opposite of the radio show <laughs> you listen to all day long, it's harder for you to be friends. Yeah. And in COVID, all of us notice this. Guess what? Your neighbor is your neighbor, and you should go over there and have an agreement about how you park your car, you know, or whatever, <laughs> uh, you know, what the border is and who's going to take down the tree right. <laughs> that hangs over one yard dangerously but is rooted in the other yard and where the property line is and what the dogs think the property <laughs> line is, of course, too. Because they are the guardians. Uh, That conversation, like, doesn't happen or happens less. And those people who are able to transcend their favorite radio show and make friends with their – those are good people. And they ought to be school teachers or presidents, you know, (laughs) Uh, because we're we're all not that different. Um, And you find people ratting on each other. One of the things that is they'll report out someone to some authority as a kind of virtue signal on themselves. Well, that used to be called denouncing people. Like that's what happened in bad places in Europe in the past. But Americans usually don't do that. You know, rat to some foreign or far away authority. But it it has to do with their they feel more connected to their political community than they do the people in their town. And mm. it, that that has to be rebuilt. And one of the things we do at Coolidge um, is do we do talk about that because I'm going to say something positive about teachers. Teachers work hard. And it, it parents, I'm for a school choice, and I see the virtue in it and so on. But parents are very close now to what's happening in class. And when kids go home and complain and the parent comes in, that eats the teacher time and it, it yeah. reduces the trust between the kid and the teacher. And the teacher can't discipline the kid, right? Right. So so we have to think how we have infantilized and imprisoned teachers through our political sanctimonies or agendas of whatever variety. Set aside their politics, which are sometimes, sometimes obnoxious, because often teachers are close to the kids in the class, as close as they are to a left-wing curriculum. Right. And But we've got to help them stick to the classroom, and we've got to back them up in the classroom. And that is an example of trust that's really lost. Yeah. Uh, uh, it used to be the parents would say, well, if the teacher says you're wrong, you're wrong most of the time. 
you know? Yeah. Uh, and now it's the parent picks a fight and then goes on TV about right. it and exactly. gets airtime. Is this parental vanity, fellow parents, I ask yeah. you? You know, some <laughs> of the time it is. Yeah. It's uh. just showtime for a bored parent. That's right. And that's both parties. So there we are. I think the only area this can happen in is community and often religious community mm. or school community. It's not something you learn on the national level. Yeah. There's a huge amount of trust that makes tax changes possible. Yeah. Uh, I sound like I'm weeping, but I'm not. <laughs> um, and you all have to assume most of you are pretty good guys to get something done in that area. Yeah. And that's the thing. Or budget, you know. Yeah, that's right. And it all it all comes full circle on that. The great perspective as always, always brilliant writing. Amity Slays uh, is the chair uh, of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation, just an extraordinary writer and thinker and uh, always helps us get back to the lessons of Coolidge and beyond. And so many of those we just need right here in the here and now. And uh, Amity, thanks so much for making time for us today. Oh, thank you. I want to mention that if you look at our at CoolidgeFoundation.org, you can sign up for our newsletter uh, and so you can know what's going on. We have a Coolidge movie. We're showing it to groups. If you want it in your town or have an event, we have a Coolidge gala. Fred Smith is the speaker this year. And what the Coolidge Foundation does is try to educate young people in all these values that we've discussed on this show. We are eager to have you get to know us. And we're not a government-supported agency like most presidential Libraries were um, more like Hillsdale College. We work with the state of Vermont, but otherwise right now we are an independent little foundation fighting to restore Coolidge values for young Americans. Great insight as always from Amity Slays, uh, chair of the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. So many principles that we got into over these last two segments. If you missed those, make sure you go pick it up on the podcast later on this afternoon. We're going to step aside for one last break, come back with some final thoughts on inside sources here on KSL News Radio. Stick around. We'll be right back. People ask me all the time, so how hard was the soda weight loss program? And the truth is it was easy. If I ever started to feel hungry, I would let them know I'm feeling hungry. And they'd add something to my weekly menu that would reduce the hunger pains yeah. or do, do away with them. I, they're just brilliant. They're nutritionists at Soda Weight Loss. They've helped people all over the country. And you can go and read their Google reviews. It's ridiculous how many people they've helped. I'm just one of thousands of people. And you do the entire program over the phone, so you don't have to worry about blocking out a whole bunch of time for this. This is going to improve your health. And there's no pills. There's no counting calories. They say 80% of life change comes from your brain. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they help change that aspect of what food means to you in your life and get you to look at food a little bit differently. They did that for my daughter, who lost 42 pounds herself and continues now on the maintenance phase, which means you stay on and just check in with your nutritionist every couple of weeks for as long as you need to at no extra charge. Go to SotaWeightLoss.com, spelled S-O-T-A. It is state-of-the-art. When it's hot like this, air conditioners struggle to keep up. Parts are under more stress, and sometimes those parts fail. What's up, everybody? I'm Mike Wilson with Any Hour Services, and no one helps more homeowners maintain and repair their air conditioners than Any Hour Services. As a matter of fact, last year, over 32,000 homeowners called Any Hour Services for help maintaining and repairing their systems. Any Hour Services has over 100 HVAC technicians to help with everything from maintenance, repair, to installing a new system. This summer, there'll be a lot of people told they need to replace their air conditioner, and they'll wonder, do I really need to? If you're told you need to replace your air conditioner and you still have questions, any Hour Services can give you a second opinion and let you know what options are available. Maybe it just needs a little maintenance or a small repair. Maybe it does need to be replaced, but if you don't feel good about being told you need to replace your air conditioner, don't ignore those feelings. Call Any Hour Services for help with air conditioner maintenance, repair, or to schedule a free second opinion. Google Any Hour Services or schedule online at anyhourservices.com. No one helps more homeowners than any hour services. Attention taxpayers, ready for some bad news? With $80 billion in new funding from Congress, the IRS has launched their most aggressive hiring campaign ever to ramp up enforcement. If you're ignoring your taxes, don't delay another minute because your paycheck, your bank account, even your home or business could already be at risk. Now, here's the good news. Optima Tax Relief, America's number one tax relief firm, can get to work immediately, helping to protect you 
from the IRS. A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau, their tax attorneys and licensed professionals are experts at resolving tax problems. Let them help determine if you qualify for the Fresh Start Initiative or other powerful IRS tax assistance programs. Take control. Call Optima Tax Relief now for a free consultation. Call 800-343-6460. 800-343-6460. 800-343-6460. Optima Tax Relief. Some restrictions apply. For complete details, please visit OptimaTaxRelief.com. Imagine how inconvenient your life would be without power. No lights, no refrigeration, no heating or cooling, and no electronics. But with a Generac Home Standby Generator, you'll have the power when you need it most. Generac generators automatically provide backup after sensing a power outage, so your life goes on uninterrupted. Schedule a free quote today with Genco Generators, your premier Generac service dealer in Utah. Call 801-295-0872 or online at GencoGenerators.net. With the economy the way it is, you're probably staying put. So invest in your home, your number one asset, with beautiful custom replacement windows from Advanced Window Products. They're a local Utah company building beautiful vinyl framed and insulated double pane windows for 37 years right here in Salt Lake City. Advanced Window Products will save you money on your energy bill. Get security features to keep your family safe in an Advanced Window products it's all custom and the best part they're local they build the windows they install the windows and they guarantee them for life so there's no middleman markup you save on the highest quality windows in utah plus rocky mountain and dominion offer rebates for a limited time they offer 60 months zero percent financing and right now get two thousand dollars off 10 windows or more they're working eight weeks out so make the call now advanced window products 801-850-9100 that's 801-850-9100 or visit advancedwindowsusa.com with the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bonas. First, the leader of a mercenary group who led an armed rebellion against Russia's military leadership in Ukraine was apparently killed in a plane crash in Russia. Second, the Utah legislature wants to look at the companies that extract minerals from the Great Salt Lake, partly to make sure the state is getting its share of revenue. Third, police in Pittsburgh have been dealing with a standoff that required evacuation of a neighborhood with dozens of shots fired. Right now, 85 degrees and partly cloudy in Salt Lake City. Back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Hear elevated conversation on crucial issues. Boyd Matheson on Inside Sources. Welcome back to Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. It's great to be with you today, as always. I am Boyd Matheson. As we round out the show today, if you missed the last two segments, you missed a, just an incredible conversation with Amity Slays uh, with the Coolidge Foundation. So many important principles there that apply today. Uh, Coolidge is a vastly underestimated and unrecognized president uh, that we all should be looking to for some good guidance in a very tumultuous time that we have now. And I want to go back to a, a couple of things because I think they're really relevant as we try to solve big problems and small problems in the country. Uh, I thought it was uh, most interesting. We we began our conversation uh, talking about the fact that there was this uh, big flood in Mississippi when Coolidge was president, and he chose not to go. He chose not to go. And everyone complained and said, you need to go there. You're the president to console, you need to do all of those things that we expect. And some people criticized President Coolidge saying, well, it's not your hometown, so that's why you're not going. It's Mississippi. Well, later on, there was a catastrophe in his hometown in Vermont, and Calvin Coolidge didn't go. Now, he didn't go because he didn't care. He didn't go because Coolidge believed in the states. He had absolute confidence in the states. And I loved how Amity described it, that, look, the states uh, were the important part of this, that Coolidge was kind of this modern founder. He was this bridge back to the original founders of this country uh, and showed how the principles of the founding actually can still be applied in a modern world. And that idea of federalism, that we can get it back to the people, and sometimes we throw that word around, and, and sometimes it sounds like big national government because it, it is the word federal. <laughs> but let's clarify it just a little bit, just to be really clear. Now, the Bill of Rights Center defines federalism as a basic principle of the U.S. Constitution, 
When the framers created the Constitution, they did not only establish a system of checks and balances to separate powers within the national government, three branches, of course, they also divided authority between the state and the national government. So that division creates really clear spheres of responsibility for each level of government. And what does that do? It promotes local control, prevents tyranny, or the concentration of power in the hands of one person or one body. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was right when he assessed it this way. The government closest to the people serves the people best. And serving the people is what government should be about. So the national government clearly has a role to play and needs to carry out all of those things that only a federal national government can do, declaring war, signing treaties with other nations, minting currency, establishing the post office, creating a system of immigration. Uh, Those are just a few of the things that the national government has to do. Other activities were designed to be dealt with by the state and by the local government and by the people themselves. So we have to start looking at a different direction. I think Coolidge had the blueprint just right and was humble enough to recognize that it wasn't about him. We talked about the fact that we're going to have eight people on the stage tonight vying to be the nominee for the Republicans. Uh, Interesting, Coolidge was incredibly popular, could have run for another term, and didn't. And his party, the Republican Party, was none too happy about that. Why? Because Coolidge had incredibly long coattails that would have helped all of them stay in power. But he had this humility and this understanding that it was about the office. It wasn't about the occupant of the office. It wasn't about a politician. It was the office that mattered, not who happened to be sitting behind the desk at the time. And Coolidge always described that Humility, that understanding of what it was really all about, that it wasn't about him as president. He said that was a great advantage to the president and a great safety to the people. Having someone who understands their used by date, who knows when to walk off the stage, even if they're still popular, even if they're still in power. And that brings it full circle back to federalism that Coolidge believed in the states. He had incredible confidence that the states not only should, but had the capacity and could do all of these things. And even in these big disasters, we're, we're getting so used to the federal government immediately coming in, overwhelming everything to solve all the problems. And then we do that over and over and over again on everything from education to immigration to criminal justice reform. To families. And when this looking to the, the federal government to solve all the big problems is the big problem. Uh, I pointed out earlier that uh, I think one of the ultimate showcases of what Coolidge was all about, that he didn't take himself too serious, that he knew he was just an occupant for a season of stewardship in the Oval Office, was the fact that even as a president of the United States, his funeral was 22 minutes long total. Start start to the final amen, 22 minutes. Two hymns, no eulogy, very simple. Because it wasn't to be about him, it was to be about the principles, the country, and the people. And so why we have the, the needs of our nation today are many, uh, far more than any government could ever provide. The answer is going to be found in communities and community-driven organizations, community-driven solutions. Because the the solutions that flow when the people are there and as we see each other as fellow travelers, that's when we get to the best solutions. And so I think it's time for us to maybe take a little page out of the Coolidge playbook and get back to some good old-fashioned federalism and community